All right. Well, let's get started here since I, we and I are the only people who stand between you and lunch. Uh, before we start our next session, I'd like to thank Misha Johns for joining us this weekend. She too is a stunt double for us to handle the technical end of live streaming this conference. So here, here it's going. She disappeared. There she is. She's sitting on the front on the front row here. That's why I couldn't find her. So, and then I was also asked when would the silent auction end, and it will end at two thirty. So you'll have time to uh, peruse the items um, at lunch and go back and try to outbid other people. Uh, in the meantime. Our speaker now is Zachary Wood. He's the Georgia Grasslands Coordinator, both at the State Botanical Garden here uh, in Athens, State Botanical Garden of Georgia. How many of you have already been? Right. Okay, everybody get up and go this no, afternoon. The Franklinia is blooming. How about that? Okay. Time to take a picture. And so, but beyond the, the really fancy flowering plants, we're so delighted to start thinking more about grasslands in Georgia and in the Southeast. Zach's expertise is in prescribed fire as a land management tool for endangered species, especially reptiles and amphibians in the coastal plain ecoregion. He's worked for the Orianne Society. It's well known to many of you for its efforts to conserve and restore populations of Southern reptiles and amphibians, and notably the uh, indigo snake. That also is a certified wildland firefighter, but no, no open flames, please, in the, in the auditorium. His goal is recreating grasslands where people can go and see what a prairie in this region might have looked like historically so that people have the opportunity to see and appreciate not just the plants, but the whole ecological impact of grasslands. So we welcome him today. Thank you so much for being with us. Today. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm coming back from a cold, so we'll see how long I can make it. Um, I really appreciate being invited to come. I've never been to the Bartram Trail Conference, so it's pretty neat to roll in on such a monumentous year. Um, but as Dorinda said, my name is Zach Wood. I'm the Grasslands Coordinator for the Southeastern Grasslands Institute and the State Botanical Garden here in Georgia. And uh, also, my background is in wildlife. Uh, I'm a wildlife guy. I didn't mean to become a botanist, for sure. Um, but I've found my home there. And so whenever I first started out, I was interested in wildlife, like the, the amphibians, the snakes, and you've heard the analogy of a, boiling a frog. Um, they don't realize what's happening to them. I was too busy looking at frogs. And next thing you know, I, I become a botanist one day because really this area of the food chain is where land managers and wildlife managers do their business. Um, this is what we can manipulate. Um, and if I'm being honest, I, I'm still not quite there on the decomposers, but um, so we need to start with what we would call a grassland. And we're gonna operate off the definition that grasslands are natural communities or ecosystems in which the herbaceous layer is dominated by grasses, graminoids, such as sedges, and the associated forbs. And I want to highlight these are natural communities or ecosystems <laughs> and that they do include associated forbs. And so if you leave with nothing else, it's that fescue pastures are not grasslands in Georgia and grasslands do include wildflowers. And so a lightning round of grassland or no grassland, um, longleaf pine savanna, grasslands, Sand hills, grasslands, fescue fields, no grasslands. <laughs> so again, any natural community or ecosystem in which the herbaceous layer is dominated by grasses, graminoids, and the associated forbs, the wildflowers. And so in the Southeast and the Mid-South, 
grasslands would have looked very different um, across the landscape. And that's a different subject for a different day, but you can get with me afterwards, or if you're fast, you can grab that QR code and it'll take you to this free guide to the grasslands of the Mid-South. It really dives into these different types of grasslands. Um, so why I care about grasslands from a plant conservation perspective? Uh, Georgia DNR currently tracks 783 species of plants. And if we're conservative and we say that half of those are associated with grasslands, that's hundreds of species that are tied to these ecosystems. And then from the perspective of wildlife, which is how I got here, uh, we think of things like monarch butterflies. Everyone's aware of pollinator conservation, but our pollinators really depend on grassland ecosystems, such as this milkweed that, that monarch's hanging out on. And then we can look at grassland birds to see the importance of grasslands in the southeast. We see statistics like the fact that grassland birds have suffered a 53% population loss since 1970. Um, and then this guy is always a telltale. You, you can go anywhere in the southeast and ask someone about northern Bob White, which is the quintessential grassland bird. And the old timers will tell you the same story. It doesn't matter where you're at, um, that when they were kids, there were coveys of Bob White quail everywhere. And now they hardly ever see them if they see them at all. And it turns out the old timers are right because according to the North American Breeding Birds Survey, we've lost 3.1% of Bob White populations between 1966 and 2019. So they're spot on with their observations. And then lastly, why care about grasslands from the perspective of ecological services? We've already talked about their impact of pollinators and pollinators support agricultural systems. Um, but then beyond that, the root systems of grassland habitats function to hold erosion and they filter rainfall and runoff. And this is an interesting graphic, very blurry. If anybody has a clear one of these that I could use, that'd be sweet. But um, you can't read the numbers, but this far left side is Bermuda grass, which is this a thin layer of carpet on top of the ground. And then everything beyond that are some of our native species to North America. And those roots are penetrating well below four feet, eight feet. Um, and so they really hold on to soil, whereas a lot of our turf grasses don't. And then lastly, Grasslands sequester carbon. Whenever we think of carbon storage, everyone thinks of forests, but that's not the whole story because grasslands also lock up carbon. And I like to think of it as if you had a million dollars, I don't, but if you had it, um, would you store it under your mattress or would you put it in a bank? And this graphic is really helpful. Storing our carbon in forests only is like putting that money underneath your mattress and storing it in grassland ecosystems is like putting it in the bank. It's not susceptible to wildfires, natural disaster. Um, and so in case anybody's skeptical about whether or not grasslands were here, I'm going to use three different types of evidence to prove to you that we did have grasslands, or maybe we do have grasslands. And those are historical accounts, botanical indicators, and then just grassland remnants. So with the historical accounts, I do have to handle photos like this, these massive chestnuts, but I would argue that the entire Southeast wasn't a closed canopy hardwood forest from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River, but it would have been a patchwork or a mosaic landscape with various habitat types changing pretty quickly as you move across the landscape. And we have evidence of this mosaic in some of these maps that were created in the 1700s by cartographers. And they documented things like Grand Savanes, but that's in the Midlands of the Carolinas. Um, I don't think anybody's surprised there's a savanna in the Midlands of Carolina. But this next map shows us more savannas in Southeast Georgia, the Midlands, 
and then over in Alabama all leave in good ground. But then this next one is interesting because it's on the inland side of the Appalachians and it's more savanna lands and more good pasture ground. And then the man of the hour, William Bartram, uh, also told us a lot about the landscape, but I share others sentiment that I wish he had told us more. But alas, he told us enough. So over near the Chattahoochee River in Alabama, he documented extensive grassy fields and brooks coursing through green plains. He doesn't tell us what those grassy fields and the green plains are, but we do know that they were there. And then just a little further east of that, there's a chain of grassy savannas. And now up in our part of the world, near the Oconee River, native meadows and cane breaks. And then up around <clears throat> the Seneca River, he writes, the tops of the more barren grassy hills where large trees are few and scattered make a fine appearance. So not a closed canopy forest for sure. And then down closer to Augusta, expansive plains, detached groves, chains of hills with dry, barren summits. So I wish he had given us a species list, but he didn't. Um, but in this wide array of sites that he did document some kind of open habitat, it does begin to paint this different image than what maybe we all have in our minds. And then we have botanical indicators. Um, if Georgia in the southeast was closed canopy hardwoods from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi, then how do we account for species that persist in open sunny habitats? Things like the different milkweeds, rudbeckias, colic root, um, those things don't exist in closed canopy settings. And then lastly, we have the grassland remnants. So I have no idea what this structure was, but I know that it was there because there's a piece left. And so maybe Georgia wasn't covered up in grasslands, but there are at least some grassland pieces that would say otherwise. Places like Burke's Mountain over in Columbia County, which is a, a pretty special site. It's got a certain type of soil that helps support this open sunny condition as well as would have been maintained by fire. And then over in the west portion of the state, we have Sproul Bluff that would have been longleaf, well, is longleaf, short, shortleaf pines, sand hickory, post oaks, chestnut oaks, sparkleberries. Um, and then up in our part of the world, the Broad River WMA up in Madison County, these photos are from this week. Um, and so you can see that this understory is largely, you know, those grasses and forbs. And so I would argue that we do have grasslands, but they are hidden in plain sight in places like power line rights of ways. Um, you can see the, the Asclepius tuberosas kind of popping in that photo. And then on roadsides, and so what happened to these grasslands? Uh, one thing is land conversion. As we've moved in, things have changed on the landscape. Fire suppression has played a role. And then invasive species. And then beyond that, what are we going to do about it? And so at the State Botanical Garden, we're building a, a grasslands network to address some of these issues. And with any network, we kind of have decided that we need four pieces, partnerships, uh, we need training and expertise, we need resources, and we have to have landowner interest. And so this is the building network of partnerships across the state. The red indicates a partner, the blue indicates a restoration site. And then beyond that, training and expertise, we're, we're constantly trying to learn and hone skills for restoration work. But then beyond that, at the State Botanical Garden, we're working with our partners to share that knowledge outwards and also 
with students who work with us at the State Journal who already. And then the resources <clears throat> is kind of a big piece because we have expertise in labor that's needed, um, equipment, plant materials, and financial support. So these are all legs of that. And lastly, we're just making grasslands known to the general public because we do have this cultural amnesia where we've we've forgotten about grasslands. So in 2023, some of our key objectives are to continue building those new partnerships, nurturing our existing ones. And SGI hosted their first workshop that focuses on grassland remnants and restoring them. And then we're also working with U.S. Forest Service National Office, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, USDA NRCS, and other partners to address the, the lack of plant materials in the Southeast, specifically in Georgia. And so lastly, what can you do to help with grassland conservation? Uh, just as, as an everyday person, I would say plant natives in your yard. Uh, this is one of the fun things you can do. And I think this is a very realistic photo. You can see there's, there's flocks and rudbeckia in there, but there's also some cosmos and just some annual non-natives mixed in, but this is a very functioning garden for sure. This next one kind of hurts, but we have to stop planting invasive species. Um, things like Nandina, privet hedges, um, miscanthus. And then another fun one, I would say visit a grassland. Uh, there's one right down the road at 2450 South Millage Avenue at the State Botanical Garden. And you can see things like Menarda, um, Pygmanthemums, and right now, if you've never seen Madalea seed pods, there are some out there, photo from this week, so. And do we still have time? Because I could do restoration stuff. Also, I noticed that I, I didn't give credit on a, a slide for a photo, and I should, to our friend Philip Juris. Yeah, I used one of his paintings and didn't. Whenever I moved my slideshow over, I didn't get all the text boxes, but I do appreciate that photo or the painting. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> um, so how to restore native and semi-native grasslands. If we wanted to get into this topic, there are four general things that I'm thinking about with this. I wanna take an inventory, see what's on the ground. Um, we need to address the invasive species. We have to alter management practices. And then lastly, we reintroduce additional biodiversity. So why take an inventory? Well, what if you have lady slippers or um, Platanthra species or things like Silene regia, the royal catch fly. Um, that'd be important to know before you start a restoration project. But what if you have Johnson grass, um, Chinese lespedeza, or microstegium, Japanese stilt grass? Also important to know about whenever you're starting a restoration project. And so how would you take um, an inventory. I think the easiest thing I could suggest to someone is to use a platform like iNaturalist. Um, and then you can document species through time on a, a track of land and see what's there. And you can develop a species list over time. And after that, you certainly have invasive species and you have to address them. Um, and there are two ways to do that. You can use mechanical treatment or chemical treatment, um, most often you have to use these two things in tandem with one another. Um, but it's important to note that these are all temporary things. If done properly, um, you can move past this stage of invasive species control. And then you have to alter the management. Grasslands aren't lawns, and so we can't treat them like lawns. Um, we have to reintroduce the proper disturbance, whether that be fire, you can hay them, um, or 
if you have sheep, you could graze them carefully. And lastly, you can reintroduce biodiversity. So once you've developed this species list, you know what's on site, and you've removed the invasive species, then you get to do the fun part of adding the cool forbs and grasses that may not be there anymore that you want to have there. Um, but it's a common mistake to do this step too soon, and it makes a mess because you have invasive species and then really expensive native species, and you have to figure out how to get the bad thing out without killing the good thing. And so generally, restoration seems like a simple process. You take an inventory, you introduce disturbance, you kill the invasives, and you add biodiversity. But on the ground, it begins to look a lot more like this because nature is very much an input-output system. You poke the bear and you see what happens, um, but you can eventually get them back. And that's all. Yes, sir. Uh, if you look at a satellite map uh, over in Alabama, you can still see the boomerang shape uh, of the black belt that goes on, I think, just east of Montgomery over in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that's really good farmland now. And I, I'm guessing that would be grassland back in the bottom of the hill. Certainly. And there are still, you can find those remnants of that specific type of prairie even today over in that part of the state. We don't have, well, maybe we have a piece of black one that kind of touches me. Mm. Yes. But they did have that a peculiar soil yeah. that would have contributed to that. Mm -hmm. Seems like down there. I would say there's a stilt grass expert in the room, but brief, briefly, stilt grass is an annual, so it produces a lot of seeds, but it, it's only an annual. And so if you can get ahead of that seed production cycle, um, then it's pretty simple. And there are selective herbicides yeah, that will... Surge tree that I'm seeing, it's been in It seems prevalent all of a sudden. I, maybe we just didn't know. Maybe it's been around and now we're just now, you know, once you see a problem, you see it everywhere. Um, so it may be that. Yes. Does the uh, Grasslands Council of Abbott Park uh, doing anything to counter this massive spraying that seems like EDOT or the power company counties now spraying everything? You know, landowners out here just trying to protect our land from birds and birds species. Yes. Each, each of those entities has a different challenge associated with them. Um, but I would say some of the best grassland sites in the state of Georgia are in power line rights of ways, um, large transmission lines specifically, because generally speaking, they have a good regimen where they, they mow very infrequently, six, seven years between mowing. And they go through and they treat hardwoods like sweet gums every two years with backpack sprayers selectively. And so that's very successful. But then the roadside issue is a completely different thing um, that we are working to try to help address. Um, but, yeah. But a lot of the roadsides are 
largely invasive species at this point too. So it it's a cumbersome thing to turn that ship, but it is being worked on slowly but surely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we have a few restoration projects with GDOT. Uh, one here in the bowl. There's one, one of the old gateway projects on I-85 in Livonia is now a native planting in the medium. And then they're working on some of the rest areas. But a lot of it comes down to public perception. What native plants need is what we don't like, and that's kind of rough tall grass, unkempt. Um, and so it, it's a challenging dance of doing ecological good and also maintaining an appearance that we've grown accustomed to. Um, so they're trying to address audiences at places like rest areas and just kind of change what we see as good and bad by doing some of these native plantings. But, Yes. So it, it depends on the site, but two things can be happening. There can be a seed bank, um, or more likely, if you have a site that has been timbered and allowed to grow up dense, and then they go through and do a thinning operation, oftentimes, if it's never been plowed, you'll see in the next year, you'll see this resurgence of native plants, things that kind of amaze you that were there. And those are likely rootstocks. So it's just a plant hanging out and it produces one photosynthetic leaf, you know, never flowers. Um, and then whenever it's given light, you know, they, they come back. And I think that's the only thing that explains that phenomenon because seeds wouldn't germinate and then produce flowers that quickly. So, and then there are other cases where things like broom sedge can seed back in pretty successfully on the site. Yes. Um, well, extensive savannas. Is there any notion of how people got started? When fires? How the fires started? Oh. This might be beyond what I'm comfortable taking a guess at, admittedly. <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. Certainly, in some cases, places like Birch Mountain, uh, the Black Belt, and then but yeah, what came first, the fire or the savannah? Mm -hmm.
at the broad river yeah. wma that site is probably a combination of a few things it it's a little overgrown it's got closed canopy areas and that suppresses a lot of the the veg layer but it also i mean you're familiar with the topography there those shallow soils have contributed but there are on top of the hills there are shortly pines and fire tolerant oak species and then things like uh georgia calament are there kind of cascading down those rock slopes so i think that's been there and just maybe hidden away i don't think it's on the right side of the river it's all been terror mm -hmm. i thought it was short leaf pine i think i saw short leaf out there this okay. week i did have a cold though so maybe i had a fever i was just walking yeah. around out there <laughs> I think grassland areas were definitely farmed early because whether by Native Americans or by uh, settlers, because arable land is valuable and you can make food quickly with it versus taking trees down and establishing new open land. Um, but that specific question, I, I'm not sure. Um, if you I'm talking about your last slide, basically saying biodiversity. I come from Alabama and we had the same independent prairie across the Black Belt. So I imagine genetically they might have developed the same thing. So I'm an archaeologist studying next to a prairie reservoir. And I worry that. When you reintroduce these plants, are you recreating something that never existed just because you're because you're interested in wildlife? Mm. As opposed, is there do, do y'all fight me? Think <laughs> that way? Or, I know I have arguments with them. I like these are our living artifacts, so it's okay. But uh, I really do am concerned that that whole period of the plant system they're gonna. Yes, that's 
that becomes a, a deep hole to fall into. Um, but certainly the right ecosystem. I'm only a grasslands guy because grasslands are appropriate for the place that I'm at. Um, but beyond that, uh, you know, the right plant for the right grassland for the right piece of dirt is the ultimate goal. Um, but a lot of our native species kind of bleed from one to the other. You know, little blue stem is a grass that spans the grasslands uh, generally until you get into the wet thing. So there are a lot of generalists, but we also get into the, the conversation of ecotypes, where can I use Athens little blue stem in a blackland prairie in Alabama? And that that gets complicated and are you I think within one man's brain there are arguments <laughs> about that. <laughs> So the, through the succession after the climax stage, yeah. would grasslands follow? Yeah. I, yes, in some way, in a natural disaster that wiped out that climax forest, yeah. that could be it. But I think that in the southeast, the disturbance would have historically prevented those climax forests in certain parts. So in low wet areas, things like fire would have happened less frequently and allowed for succession to move forward. We would have a different species of tree. But in the high dry sites where the southwest coast slopes and those areas probably would have received fire more often and it would have kind of held things at a early successional state, but maybe that early su successional state is the climax because of the way the system functions um, with prescribed fire and grazing and those things. Um, but disturbance happens. It's just when and how bad is the disturbance going to be. So, yeah, if we let some of those uh, high dry sites go to the climax, certainly something's going to happen. And, Bring that to the end at some point. Yes, an important one too for warblers. 